welcome to another episode of the Film Library, a Canopy podcast. I'm Daniel Thompson. I'm Alonzo Duraldi. And we're here to talk to you about the endless, seemingly endless, I don't want to say endless, <laughs> there's lawyers at play here, the seemingly it endless. It is finite, but it might as well be that's infinite. Right, the seemingly endless <laughs> amount of content at your fingertips on the Canopy app with just the library card, Alonzo. That's right. That's no right. ads, no subscription fees. And uh, today we're going to be focusing on what for me is one of the most exciting uh, uh, facets of Canopy, and that is their vast library of documentary and nonfiction films. Um, you know, you, going all the way back to the silent era, Ziga Vertov's influential Man with a Movie Camera, which... It continues to make it into the top 10 of the sight and sound list every decade. Yeah. It's a movie that kind of invented modern editing. And it's also this incredible just look at what the world looked like in the 1920s. Um, all the way through to the library of films by the great Frederick Wiseman, all of which are here on Canopy. Um, up to his most recent films, uh, like Ex Libris, his look at the New York Public Library. Um, it's it's a it's a vast array. And, and we're going to be just... Just skimming the surface, That's really, right. of all the many uh, choices that you've got here on A Canada. fascinating genre, and we've talked about this before, but you know, with physical media going by the wayside, there yes. are fewer and fewer places where you can find what you want to watch, especially if that's a documentary, especially if it's an old documentary. Indeed. Uh, and this this is what makes this this collection so very special, and Canopy seems to be uh, really highlighting this as yes. part of what they do. Uh, it seems like most streaming services are constantly moving in the wrong direction and taking stuff off of their service and, and depriving you of the opportunity of digging back, whereas Canopy offers more than 30,000 titles, and uh, it, it covers the waterfront when it comes to cinema. It's not just a thing of like, oh, it's the new, the flashy, the, the whatever, although there are a lot of new titles here and a lot of recent films that were in theaters not so long ago, uh, but if you want a deep dive into genre, whether it's documentary, Entry, whether it's uh, you know horror and sci-fi or, or comedies or uh, anything else, uh, you know you are going to find so many options here at Canopy with just your library card. And I, I got to tell you, as someone that doesn't get to watch theatrical releases for a living, unlike you, <laughs> uh, the documentary is the genre of film I'm most likely to not get to at the movie theater. Sure. Um, and I I would say that it loses the least amount going from big screen to small screen in most cases. Uh, and so having the ability to catch up on the movies that I miss in the theater, uh, forget watching you know a favorite that you've watched a dozen times. There's so many... I, I find the proportion of new documentaries that I've not seen mm -hmm. to be far greater than any other genre that Canopy has. And so I could just spend my time watching documentaries. Um, we're going to get to talk to Alex Winter a little bit later on yes. today, which is very exciting. We'll talk more about that later. But his documentary, YouTube Effect, I was able to watch that on Canopy, a fascinating look at, at how YouTube changed the game uh, of, of what it looks like to be in business uh, streaming video, uh, which is very current and relevant right now. So I, I think the cool thing about the documentary genre is you go to canopy and you're going to get some heavy hitters, best picture winners. But when it comes to documentaries, you're going to be hard pressed to find a better collection at any price, much less <laughs> ad free, no, no subs library card. Uh, the documentaries really stand out here. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if you've got access to your public library, to your academic library, you've got a key to pretty much just the greatest documentary films that are out there. And I think it's such an exciting genre. I always tell people when they go to film festivals, don't sleep on the documentaries because those movies are often uh, some of the best things that you're going to get your hands on and the ones that you will be least likely to see later in theaters because yes a lot more of them are getting released now but you know very often those releases are limited to larger cities maybe one night at a museum somewhere um so I think that for a lot of uh, Canopy subscribers, depending on where it is they live, this may be the first access that they get to a lot yeah. of these titles. And uh, it really, they really are some of the best films that are being made right now. Uh, my absolute favorite film of 2020 uh, was a Romanian documentary called Collective. It's here on Canopy. Um, and it could not be more relevant about the world we live in today in terms of 
uh, dealing with healthcare, dealing with the importance of a free press uh, to to you know uh, uh, tell uh, uh, you know to dig into you know, government corruption and and other um, uh, channels that require you know uh, that need to be exposed to the public. Um, so you know, and and it's a suspenseful, thrilling film. It is as much of a nail biter as like a really great spy movie. Uh, so just because it's nonfiction doesn't mean that it's broccoli. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that is sometimes there's a there's some sort of veneer on docs that they're not yeah. as accessible when they're really more accessible. Sure. I, I can remember the first time I saw a documentary in the theater. It was Super Size Me, coincidentally, mm. also on Canopy. But I remember going, I can't believe I'm paying a full theater ticket price as a 19 year old to see a documentary. And it blew my mind. Yeah. Like it was, it was, it was revelatory. And so it really is a, an opportunity to get uh, a new narrative that you're not getting in, in a lot of, uh, you know, fictional or, or movies that are made that aren't documentary. So I, I do think this is a prime time for us to get to dive into this world, give some fun recommendations at the end. But before we do that, uh, we get a chance to talk to Alex winter, uh, a seasoned veteran of the documentary world uh, has made uh, numerous documentaries uh, that are available on Canopy. And I think he's going to be able to sh uh, shed a little insight on the documentary filmmaking process. Absolutely. Uh, what it's like to do that investigative journalism piece, what it's like to put together and edit what has to be miles and miles of film <laughs> uh, or digital content to make a cohesive piece. So I'm very excited about the interview coming up. Here's the Film Library trivia question for today. In May 2002, this film on gun violence became the first documentary to compete in the Cannes Film Festival's main competition in 46 years. Think you know the answer? Find out after the interview. Welcome back to the Film Library here, uh, Canopy Podcast. Uh, Alonzo's with me, and we have a very special guest to talk a little documentary film with us. Uh, he's made... Uh, Numerous documentary films, most of which you can find right here on Canopy. Uh, it's Alex Winter. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Alex, the, the, you, you, there was a very high-profile deal for your most recent film, The YouTube Effect, with Canopy. Uh, and obviously, that's a movie that is about sort of the nature of, you know, uh, streaming and online interaction right now. Uh, take us a little bit into, uh, you, you've done a lot of movies about technology. What was it about YouTube that you saw as a topic that, that really needed this uh, level of exploration? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I was... Uh, <clears throat> I'd come off of, uh, of working on Zappa, which took me six years and was so, um, I, and it's kind of similar to acting, which is obviously where I started and where, where you, especially character acting, which is what I do, where you get kind of immersed in a role, uh, you enjoy the work, but when it's over, you really like need to abandon anything to do with, with that, <laughs> that world whatsoever. <laughs> and, uh, so I had done a, a doc on the on the Silk Road black market uh, called Deep Web and the Trial of Ross Ulbricht, which was very very intense and about technology and the dark net and kind of the rise of anonymous online community. And I needed a break from that, so I went to Zappa, which was six year palate cleanser. Um, so I was kind of ready to come back and and tackle where technology was um, uh, 2018 2019. A lot of huge changes uh, that were impacting the world. Um, Gail Ann Hurd, the producer, actually reached out to me. Um, as she had seen my other films and asked me if I was interested in pursuing something around YouTube with her. She had some connections there. And I told her that I also had a lot of connections there um, and that I'd been thinking about doing something involving Google, which is, of course, the parent company that owns YouTube. So I think it was a good opportunity to uh, jump in uh, at, at that time. And I didn't realize what was about to happen to the world because no one did in terms of COVID. And the insanity of the 2020 um, election that that uh, sort of culminated with the J6 insurrection, a lot of which was impacted directly by YouTube. So um, it ended up being fortuitous in that way, and it ended up guiding what the story was. Yeah, it's almost like you knew it. Like it, you watching that documentary and knowing it came out before then, 
is uncanny. I, I think the other thing about that documentary, and I would love for you to break down a little bit as someone who's not a documentarian, just how long something like this takes. You said a six year palate cleanser. That's, that's a long palate cleanser. Like you, you start off this YouTube documentary and it seems very lighthearted and then you, you, you flip it, uh, on the, on the audience a bit and it, and it becomes very, very gripping. How long, I guess the process isn't in film because, you know, it, it's, it's more digital, but you know, how many hours of footage do we have? And then how long does it take you to decide on that final cut? Um, there's a couple of questions in there. So, so the first one is, I mean, our films can take anywhere from, uh, I have a production company set up for making, making my docs and we usually take anywhere from a year and a half minimum to, to in Zappa's case, because of, of, um, the archival needs of uh, six years. And I, we were doing other things during that time. I actually made my HBO doc showbiz kids in that window as well. But, um, we, uh, you know what we do is is we the way I work is I, I I'm running editorial while I'm running production while I'm running research so we kind of were running on three tracks at once and because that's kind of how do, the docs are sort of an odd combination hybrid of of narrative and nonfiction and journalism um, we don't really follow the rules of journalism intentionally I would argue um, uh, and that we're really looking at the nuance of, of character. We're not so caught up in, in sort of the ethics of, of, uh, of journalistic practices, which is prevents you from being able to tell stories. Um, so uh, we kind of run on those three tracks. Naf Zappa was really helpful to me on, uh, in the case of YouTube because it, there was so much archival. We were given access to, to Zappa's vault, which was infinite. It would look like the end of... of Citizen Kane, you know, just like boxes and boxes and rows and rows. And, and uh, my tiny little pokey team um, and I spent two years just uh, preserving the vault material and going through all that material. And there was a thousand hours of unseen material, which we really had to look at because there was going to be gold in there and we didn't want to miss it. So the, the process of doing that, which I'd never done before in the, quite that way, prepared us for YouTube because on day one of, of <clears throat> production, my editor, Wes, and I've worked with him on three other films, we looked at each other and we thought, well, our, our research material on YouTube is basically all of hum humanity's recorded history, <laughs> right? <laughs> because, because that's what's on YouTube. Say, you, re so, you refer to the Zappa thing as, as infinite. That, that's actually finite yeah, by comparison. comparison. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That is, that's, that is quaint, actually, <laughs> by comparison. Um, uh, so, so we, we were like, oh, my God. So what do we do? So uh, we essentially took everyone. We just said, start filling drives with material. And because I had a kind of a narrative idea of the, of the story I wanted to tell, and this was the case on Zappa as well, it was very helpful for us because I, I could put up guardrails and say, I don't need anything like this or this or this. Focus on these specific themes. Uh, but within those themes, there was an enormous amount of media to pull. So going all the way back to downloaded, you've really – kind of been digging into internet culture, whether it's Napster, whether it's YouTube. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, obviously the, the internet is sort of the overwhelming force of our lifetimes. And, and you and I are both old enough to remember a time before all of that. And, and I'm wondering if, if we're putting this together as your, your body of work, like it, is there a take you have on this? Is there a, a perspective that you've gathered, or is it just you're just trying to trying to keep up with this behemoth that has taken over our lives? Yeah, I mean, not not the latter really at all. I, I think it's really the former. I think that you know it's true. I, I grew up. We all grew up in a generation that was analog, and and I was an adult in the analog generation. So it wasn't like I was just a kid at that time. Um, I'm old and young enough to have begun working on like Microsoft Word right out of college and things like that. But it, there was no um, I got in, interested in the Internet uh, pre-web in the in the mid uh, to late 80s during the IRC kind of BBS Usenet era where everything was text based. Um, and what drew me to the Internet then is what has drawn me to telling these stories and. Um, because every filmmaker tells the same story over and over again, no matter what they're doing. Um, and whether I'm working in tech or not, I, I tend to be drawn towards, um, uh, you know, societal impact of government and corporations um, and technologies. And in the case of the Internet, these are corporate based technologies. So 
the societal impact of that on, um, on various groups of people. Uh, and I, I, I tend to, to cast pr relatively small uh, ensembles uh, in my films because I'm interested in, in really being able to dissect individuals and what these things have done to them. In the case of Downloaded, um, I got very interested in Sean Fanning's story. He had come from this kind of dirt poor, uh, almost Dickensian uh, uh, South Boston upbringing and had gone on to create a world-changing technology and, and ended up on the cover of Time and vilified and all while he was 18, 19 years old. And so I was very fascinated on the implications of that on him. Um, and then on Ross Ulbricht, who created the Silk Road. So in the case of YouTube, I'm really interested in, in community. I'm interested in the fact that YouTube, what is the societal impact of the largest tech uh, monopoly on the planet, which Google is by way of its interaction with users? Um, Apple is bigger financially by a little bit, but, but Google has many more users engaging with it around the world than Apple does. So. What is the societal impact of a company monopoly that big um, at, during this tech industrial revolution on it, on the individual? Um, I'm not really interested in the 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 kind of you know internet big w w you know what is the this is the story of our lifetime or or whatever so much as um, how is this changing and impacting the individual and largely in kind of socio political ways largely in economic ways. Um, Looking at, at countries or marginalized groups within our country, um, how is it how is it shifting and impacting them, and how is it allowing power um, to uh, to influence or exploit uh, those groups? So that's kind of been my interest going all the way back to the BBS era when I got online um, and found these incredible subgroups uh, in the Usenet era and made a lot of friends and found a lot of honestly outreach um, marginalized groups philosophy, art, literature, cinema, uh, very vibrant. Um, and I think you still find that today. It's just much bigger. And it's kind of all of those groups are now under threat uh, because of the political climate and because of what technology is doing to those groups. Uh, it's a long answer. No, I'm sorry. No, no, no. I don't know great, how to answer that quickly. Fascinating. Yeah. And the origin of your interest there does lead me to a very basic question, but I, I don't know the answer. What, your origin for wanting to become a documentary filmmaker, like did, when, at what point was it that you were like, this is something I think I can do, I'm prepared to do, that's very, very interesting, and, and I, I want to pursue it? Yeah. It's a great question. Um, we've And, and, and I've, I think I've engaged... Um, at least with Alonzo on, on, offline about or on social about this very question sometimes. But there is a whole kind of mythos of the of the auteur filmmaker, um, which I get. Like, yes, there's an authorial aspect to it. And I'm a very, you know, I love the whole sort of film cinema studies examination of, of the auteur theory. But, you know, I, I, I was an NYU film student. I came out of NYU poor, like in the mid 80s and since early 80s. And since then, I'm just hustling, right? <laughs> that's, what, that's what every filmmaker is doing. So I'd love to give you some like very effete kind of explanation for why I ended up at Docs. But what simply happened was I, I met with the Napster guys as Napster was crashing. I was making narrative films. The, the uh, kind of mid to low budget uh, grown up narrative film um, uh, business was dying yeah. at that time. Um, and it was the end of independent cinema. It was sort of late 90s, early 2000s. Um, <clears throat> streaming hadn't kicked off yet, so there was kind of a middle zone where there really wasn't anything going on um, for grown-ups. And, uh, and that's what gave birth to the to eventually to the golden age of docs because a lot of filmmakers were like, well, I don't want to – I want to tell stories for grown-ups. I don't want to make you know, superhero movies or I don't want to not work. Um, or just go do episodic TV or whatever. Uh, so I, I was very intent on telling the Napster story, and I sold it as, a, as an independent feature that I was going to direct, not independent, actually, a studio feature that I was going to direct at Paramount. Um, and they hired me to write it, and then I was going to direct it. And I wrote the drafts, and I met everybody on the label side and everything. And then it went into turnaround because everyone at MTV Films was fired, and then they just closed the doors on MTV Films, and that was the end of MTV Films. So... I spent 10 years trying to get the film made independently, couldn't, and I eventually it eventually dawned on me that it would probably be easier to sell as a doc. Uh, docs were starting to rise, and um, so I sold it in a day after like almost a dozen years of banging my head against a wall trying to get it made as an independent feature. Um, 
And I found myself on, on, you know, shooting Sean Fanning uh, and looking at him and sort of the pain and the complexity in his face and just thinking, this is so much better than my script. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's so much better than my narrative would have been. And so I, I just got bit by the bug. I don't just do docs. I do other forms of narrative and I do direct episodic and things like that. But I, I do love the medium. I, I find that it's, um, uh, it's just a very nuanced, um, very truthful examination of human condition that doesn't require protagonists and antagonists and some of the things that narrative requires. Was nonfiction film something that was a focus for you at in film school or at least part of your balanced diet or, or were those more uh, movies that you sort of sought out on your own and kind of learned from watching? No, thankfully, I went to NYU intentionally because it was more of a, uh, at that time, especially, it was more kind of the art film school. And, you know, we had amazing, we had George Stoney, at, at, who was running docs then. Um, I was a film major and a photo minor. Um, so we had Larry Clark, we had amazing people in the photo department who were sort of photo narrative oriented, and even um, some very avant-garde people in the photo and, and film department, but especially in photo, who were, uh, you know, Brackage would come and talk to us, who were very much into um, working with film in a tactile way and telling stories with with still and moving image. So, um, so those things were very very influential uh, for me. And I was a huge doc fan, especially uh, Penna Baker and Barbara Koppel and and people like that. Um, and Wiseman, obviously. Uh, so, and even like Boone Wells, um, Lamb Without Bread, because mm -hmm. Boone Wells probably my favorite filmmaker. And at NYU, I was just like a Boone Wells fanatic. Um, so that was like all I was watching all the time. <laughs> um, but but I didn't I didn't have experience doing it, and, and I was wondering while I was working on Downloaded if I could. You know, I wasn't that cocky about it to be honest. I was really a die in the wool narrative guy, and I'd been trained that way. Um, but I, but I did figure it out, and, and I did find there were similarities not only to narrative but also to acting, oddly enough, uh, that helped me a lot in, in making docs. Did your experience on Downloaded, where it started as a narrative project and became a doc, sort of inform the way that you research movies now in terms of going into it as though you were writing the screenplay version of this but actually doing it just as the prep work to make a nonfiction film? Yeah, a hundred percent. That's how I do them. Um, in fact, I am W the, the movies that we do are WGA signatory. Um, and I do write on them quite a bit. A lot of it doesn't end up in the film. Uh, it's very similar to acting prep where you, if you're playing a character from the 19th century, you research and you research and you research and you do all this work and you write, you know, arcs out and three act arcs for the character. And then you throw it away and you go on set and you get your mark and say stuff. Right. <laughs> um, and docs are really similar because I don't, I, you know, I, I intentionally don't edit my own docs and I work very, the editor's a very important piece of, of the team. Um, and that's why I don't, um, it's maybe heretical to say there's an authorial aspect to the documentaries. They're very personal to me, but they're not auteur films in the sense that, that they really are made, um, by the director and editor, in my opinion. And, and I do them that way intentionally. I don't want the editor being some sort of slavish, you know, psychophant, just kind of following some structure that I laid out. I want them to bump against my structure. I want them to throw away the structure. I want them to come come up with other ideas. And it's really that creative relationship between us that the, the movie comes out of. Yeah, the editing piece has to be so huge. I, that, that was a question I definitely had. I Like, you know, you hear any any film that isn't scripted, where, like even like a Christopher Guest movie where he says, we'll shoot for, you know, dozens of hours. Um how does it become more difficult the more film you have to really get your final cut in? Or do you kind of have an idea? I, I think, you know, in narrative filmmaking, there's a, like, let's get one more just in case situation. But in documentary, it's like the interviews that you conduct may take you down a, a rabbit trail that you weren't even planning on exploring uh, uh, during the documentary yeah. film process. So how much does the amount of film that you have and, and what you get kind of dictate editing? Um, honestly, for me, I cut for emotion and drama. And that's really just how, that's how I was taught in school. And those are the kind of movies I like. And so even YouTube, which I think deceptively appears to be an info doc, <laughs> it really isn't an info doc. It's really a character-driven doc 
about Caleb Kane and Natalie Wynn and Carrie Goldberg and Andy Parker and this very small group of people, uh, Anthony Padilla, who got sucked into the YouTube beast and what it did to them um, and how they're going to live their lives coming out the other end of what it did to them. And because it's YouTube, which is this aggressive kind of media machine, almost like the Ludovico effect in, in <laughs> Clockwork Orange, right? Like, that's why the film looks the way it does and has so much emo- uh, information in it, because it's it's really just about assaulting you, right, aggressively, visually and audially, because that's what, when I look at YouTube, that's what that's what, how it appears to me, right? And I, that to me, that's what conveys the essence of what YouTube is. But it's really character-driven. So, so our docs tend to be character-driven and emotion-driven, um, and I'm pretty good, I'm uh, pretty merciless about chucking anything that I don't think serves the emotional arc of, and thrust of the story. And, uh, and so to answer your question, that's what ends up guiding us in terms of how the story changes more than what media we've acquired. Um, in the case of the Silk Road doc, Deep Web, that's, I was sold that as a Bitcoin documentary to, to MGM um, HD. And, uh, and I shot a lot of Bitcoin experts. And because Bitcoin was a very weird representative of this weird new culture kind of thing at the time. It wasn't a pro-Bitcoin movie. It was just about how weird things had gotten um, in technology. And I fell upon Ross's uh, family and into his defense team with such incredible access. And the story was so emotionally compelling to me that I just ditched the Bitcoin story and followed Ross. And so about a third halfway through, we changed what the movie was entirely. In the YouTube case, um, the second end of the second act and the third act was completely influenced by not only the January 6th insurrection, um, but learning uh, that YouTube had the largest role of any technology platform in inspiring um, those uh, those rioters and, and the people who committed you know crimes, including murder at the Capitol. And that was such an emotionally impactful thing. Again, and the hearing that hearing to me was while it's also comical was so emotionally impactful, um, we kind of rerouted our whole third act and followed that story. So as a doc filmmaker, uh, tell us a little about just what your experience has been about getting your work out to audiences, because there are some films that will manage to get kind of a high profile theatrical release, but a lot of them are sort of left to the vagaries of streaming. Um, And, you know, a canopy of course being such a great home for nonfiction film, what's been your experience as far as like, you know, getting your work out to the world in the current, you know, climate for, for cinema and, and, you know, how has that played out for you? You know, it's, it's a very difficult time. Um, in film, in entertain, in art and culture. Period. Um, uh, let me. You know, you can't. We can't. Not the elephant in the room is that SAG is still on strike, right? right? And the WJ only just came back and ratified, and and we're not even back at work really yet. So uh, it's a very difficult time, and a lot of that has to do with technology and the rise of technology and how it's being exploited, which is a lot of what this movie is about. Um, I won't belabor this, but I, you know, the film premiered at Tribeca. Um, in 22. And I came out of Tribeca with four offers. And by the end of the summer, every one of the companies that had offered to buy our film had been shut down, like literally wow. like wiped off Whoa. the face of the earth, um, except for one where every uh, everyone at that company had been fired. So, <laughs> I mean, the, 2023 is known in the doc community as, as like the bloodbath mm. year. And a, a good deal of the, I was on the jury, the doc jury at Tribeca that year. Uh, and a good deal of those films uh, ne- have never seen the light of day, and they're they're beautiful. Um, so I, I was aware immediately that it was going to be a tricky time to release this film, and that it wasn't going to be like, you know, on Netflix with with hundreds of millions with a massive marketing campaign. Um, but I've been making movies a really long time, and uh, and I've been making sort of a a mixture of kind of mainstream films and very underground or very independent, independent films. Um, In in the case of Freaked, which I made uh, for Fox in 1992, uh, which was a a big movie that got shelved under a a studio regime change. You know, we had a huge uh, premiere at Toronto, great reviews, and we basically got permission to self-release it. And we went around the world with prints and posters and I did that again with another film out of Cannes that I, I made called Fever in the late 90s. And I got a book, really great booking company. And I literally was like sending prints out of my apartment to Lemley and to all these art houses <laughs> and 
sitting there and working out what the audience returns were. But I learned how to distribute films myself. So uh, with YouTube, we partnered with Draft House and Alamo and with Canopy. We started being sensible about it. Like, we know that people cared about the story. We knew that people liked the movie. We knew that audiences wanted to see it. So we basically built an infrastructure that would allow us to get it in front of people. That included Canopy, thankfully. And so the film has had an extraordinarily broad release, but it's been very mom and pop. Yeah. And I, talk more about that uh, Canopy uh, perspective, because, you know, this is a world where there's more to watch at our fingertips than ever before, yet... If we you if you think that everything is available, you would be sorely mistaken. There are so many titles, like famous titles, that if you look for in the streaming world and you don't own on physical media, you're going to be out of luck. And you know, you, a lot of your documentaries are on Canopy, and some of them that's the only place that they're streaming. What's it like to be a filmmaker in the age of I made this movie, but unless you have a disc, you actually can't find it anywhere. Yeah. Look, the downside of having made the Napster doc and spent so much time in documentaries is you felt like I felt like Chicken Little. <laughs> um, it was really obvious what was going to happen. Um, and it took 20 years because here we are in 2023 and Napster went down in 2002. But it was obvious in 99, 2000 that that this tsunami was going to hit every industry and that big tech does not care about about cinema. <laughs> Right. They don't care about the art of music as much as being able to monetize the content. Right. right. That's why we have this content versus art debate. And I think that's a genuine I think it's a completely valid debate, um, not from the sort of consumer standpoint, because I don't really fault an audience if they want to. I don't care whether they call it content or cinema. I think it's a little you know, annoyingly precious. But I do think it matters when it comes to the, the tech companies, because I do think that they, they are quantifying everybody at this point. And they don't care about about the art. Um, and they don't even understand that their audience cares about the art. It's, to them, it's numbers. And uh, and they have much bigger profit coming from other areas of their business. So this isn't even an area unlike, you know, the old school Warner Brothers or Paramount or whomever, uh, where this was – they'd been doing this from the beginning, and it's what they cared about the most. So it was evident to me that this stuff was going to vanish, that they did not care about preserving – this work on the internet and the internet, the mistake that everyone kept making and talking about the internet was that it was this thing that was forever, that it was just, this was all going to be there forever. Um, and that's just, it was so blatantly not true that you could flip a switch and turn, you know, we saw during the Arab spring, you know, Egypt literally turned the internet off in Egypt. They just flicked a switch and the, and the internet was gone. And I think there was, you guys will remember this. There was a, 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 a reckoning in the entertainment industry when film struck went down yes <laughs> because everyone went oh my god where did all our movies go <laughs> and like those of us who had been like trying to get people to understand for a decade by then we were like hello like none of your work is safe like online none of it it's like not being preserved it's all going away so to have you know canopy to have criterion channel to, to have these um to have the internet archive frankly to have these organizations uh, that are not only uh, preserving this work and presenting this work, but actually genuinely care. Like, I have a relationship with the people at Canopy. I have for a long time. Like, I know them. Um, for an artist, it's, it's supremely important. Like, I'm, you know, I'm a self-starter, so I have, like, my company is a Vimeo pay-per-view page, and you can get all my docs from there generally. But to have them in an ecosystem like Canopy where schools get at them and cinephiles get at them and they're accessible because you just need a library card, um, I mean, it's just an extremely important resource. Um, and I also would argue physical media is an extremely important resource. As a movie lover, uh, what are some of your favorite yeah. aspects of Canopy? Like, what, if you're if you're you know if you're settling to the couch and you you pop it on, like, where are you likely to dig, or do you just sort of is it always something different? Um, it turns, I mean, what I like about a, a resource like Canopy is that if there's something I am in the mood for. I, it's it's curated in in a way that if it's something I'm in the mood for, I can go and find it or something that I didn't even know I was looking for that's like mm -hmm. it, right? Like it's 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 a kind of a cinema destination, and um, 
And what I like about what's really sad, if you think about it, especially if you're our age, right, is that I think about Criterion and Canopy. I mean, I grew up in New York City the way I used to think about the Thalia and the film forum. Right. Right. Like and Kim's the fact video. That there's only, <laughs> yeah. And Kim's video. And then eventually video. It's like the fact that you only have like basically two. Right? <laughs> you only have like this in the whole world. You have like two destinations for curated <laughs> cinema online is so pathetic and despairing. Um, so to me, like Canopy is like walking into the film form or walking into into the Thalia, you know, back in the day um, and, may, and just knowing there'll be something there that I want to engage with. I remember being really young, like like 13 or 14 and going to see a double feature of the American friend in Stroshek. <laughs> and I had no idea what I was walking into. <laughs> right. I was four. I was I was like. I, I was a cinephile as a little kid, but like uh, that means I like like Chaplin and Hitchcock and Buster <laughs> Keaton, like that. You know, when my friends were just watching Abbott and Costello and and you know Match Game seventy five. <laughs> um, but I wasn't that heady. But I remember walking into that theater and just like being like you know completely blown away. So the idea that that a young person or a someone who thinks they're into film but doesn't know a, a wide range of film can sort of roam into canopy, like going into a great um, art house cinema or a good retro cinema or whatever. Um, I, it's just vitally important, just the way libraries are important. Do, do you think there is any, is it like you, it is going viral or having a documentary that becomes that like, I feel like one, one a year, one every couple of years is a doc that kind of takes the world by storm and, and has this crazy word of mouth. Do you think that's algorithmic like YouTube is, or do you think that is, is Organic. just kind of luck of the draw and release? I think it's a couple of things. I think it's largely, um, uh, zeitgeist, um, backed by an enormous, usually very highly funded campaign. Um, you know, I think that the thing we learned during the Weinstein era, uh, the Miramax era, um, was really, you know, not, you know, he's a, a terrible person and many of us knew that at the time. Um, but he was also terrible, not just in his personal life, um, in terms of the very unfair way in which he, um, he campaigned for the films and uh, look, you know, Jack, you can go back to Louis V. Mayer, you can go back to like the clubs off days of early cinema. Um, so I think that, that for most filmmakers, um, I've never really looked at that world as a meritocracy. Um, to me, it's usually been fun, very heavily funded. The Oscar campaigns are very heavily funded. Even the smaller festival campaigns, very heavily funded. Um, and then it's like a gloves off cage match to like try to get your film positioned as the it film. So I don't think there's much luck involved other than maybe who wins the Oscar. Like there may be like who actually gets that at the end of the day, uh, whether it's this thing or that thing. But there are zeitgeist elements, too, in terms of where the culture is at that time. Um, you know, I'm not I have to be somewhat mindful of that because my buyers care. Right. So I can't be cavalier about it. Um, but I don't I I'm not driven by that because it to me is so far outside my control and my artistic interests. So it doesn't guide what kind of movies I make, um, it, and it doesn't guide uh, sort of what I'm doing with those films uh, in terms of aggressively trying to find. I would rather have my film be seen by a lot of people than end up on one of the big streamers and get an Oscar campaign and then get buried on their platform and never seen, which happens all the time. Oh. I mean, the films, often the films that win Sundance, no one ever sees them again. The films that win, you know, that win an Oscar or, or the docs, no one ever knows they exist outside of the parties and, and such. So I tend to be more focused on making things I care about and then working very hard to get them in front of people. Uh, can we ask what you're working on now? Uh, well, honestly, I, I stopped down during the strike. We were developing a lot, but because I am WGA as well as DJ, I mean, I'm SAG as well, but I don't act in my, <laughs> my docs. Um, uh, I did stop down. So I was developing, but I wasn't writing treatments and pitching. Um, so we just started Again, once the WGA ratified. Uh, so I'm developing a, a very big documentary, which I'm hoping we get to do, uh, which is more of a cultural doc. I'm developing a, a very juicy kind of espionage 
cyber doc, um, which would be a lot of fun and grim at the same time. Um, and I'm actually do, developing another narrative, an independent narrative feature, which I'm hoping to shoot next year. Um, so, you know, we'll see what the movie gods let us make. <laughs> He's a busy man. Alex Winter, uh, thank you so much for joining us here on the Film Library. We appreciate your expertise and the time you took to kind of walk us through some of the process and uh, and help us out here uh, on the pod and at Canopy. Uh, make sure we we call a great, a great set of features for everybody. So thanks so much for your time, man. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's time to find out the answer to today's Film Library trivia question. If you guessed the 2002 movie Bowling for Columbine, you were correct. Oh, welcome back to the Film Library Canopy Podcast. That was a lot of fun, wasn't it, Alonzo? Yeah, no, he's, uh, this is, Alex Winter has seen it all. You know, yeah. he's he's a showbiz lifer, uh, actor, director, writer, documentary filmmaker, all writer, it. all the things. Uh, so yeah, his, his latest feature, The YouTube Effect, is available here on Canopy. And uh, talking to him reminded me, another one of my favorite movies about internet culture, the documentary Feels Good Man. Not seen it. Is on Canopy. It's about, so Matt Fury is an artist. He okay. created Pepe the Frog. Okay, yeah. And he did not have any idea where like certain right-wing elements of the internet were going to take his creation and, and repurpose does he sue it. Him? No, but he does other things to sort of like make Pepe his own again, which is what the documentary is about. It's really that's on canopy. It's on I got to check that out for sure. Yeah. Um, the insight he gave on how to make a film where, where documentary film is going was also very fascinating to me. Um, there's so many documentaries on can Canopy. Uh, one of my favorite films of all time is Man on Wire. Oh, yeah. Uh, which is a documentary uh, about this guy who's who's going to be uh, on, on a tightrope. And it's a, it's a fascinating documentary. I'm sure you've heard of it. It It's it's wonderful, though. It's I've never felt quite as tense watching a documentary yeah. as watching Man on Wire. And, and the video that they have there alone is worth the price of admission, which in this case is just a library card. There so you go. pretty easy <laughs> to find. But you could tell, I think, that Alex was a lover of, of all of it. Like he, oh, yeah. he's not just a documentary guy. I think he was talking documentaries because that's what this episode's about. But like, he was just down. He was down for Canopy to tell him whatever you wanted to watch. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I think what's also great is that you you have sort of career documentarians, people like Frederick Wiseman, who I talked about earlier, who, you know, you can see his entire filmography here. But then there are also uh, filmmakers that just have included documentary as part of a, a wildly varied and eclectic career. Um, the French New Wave filmmaker Agnès Varda, who is, a, you know, a legend uh, and obviously has a lot of great narrative films to her credit, but also uh, turned out some really amazing documentaries, particularly later in life. And um, The Beaches of Agnes, which is very her sort of kind of autobiographical film that she was making as she was about to turn 80, which to me is, I watched that movie and I thought, oh, I, I have a life coach now. <laughs> I know what I want to age into. I know what I want to, you know, be active and interested and doing all these things the way that Varda was doing throughout her 70s and into her 80s. Uh, also her film Faces Places, which was nominated for an Oscar. It's her collaboration with the photographer J.R., where they were doing these photo murals, like covering the entire sides of like factories and barns and train stations out in the French countryside. And she is so willing to interact with the communities where these where these murals are being done and they're taking pictures of the people who live there and her sort of one-on-one -on -one relation with those uh, those subjects is so fascinating to watch and again she's was just somebody who was always curious and always you know wanting to like embrace new technology and embrace uh, uh, you know expanding her world, which I think as we get older, the temptation is to, to contract, to you know, down. but, right. but, but she was just out there like wanting more and wanting to learn more. And that really comes through in those docs and you can see them here on canopy. Yeah. One doc that also piqued my interest. You were telling me the historical significance of was man with a movie camera. Yeah. What, there was a lot there that I really found interesting. <laughs> what go, can you, so yeah, it, 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 it's Ziga Vertov. And you know, if you've seen films like Koyana Skatsi, where they take footage of like factories, you know, of assembly lines, things or, uh, uh, you know, people just sort of rushing through city streets. Vertov was doing that about a century earlier, you know, and, and so he, it, it is these sort of, you know, 
what quotidian scenes of uh, uh, you know factories in motion or, or or like parades or whatever it is but the way that he would edit and the way that he would throw together different angles you can it's like you're watching cinema be built you know and it's still exciting to, to this day this is a movie that is like I said about a hundred years old but it, it still just kind of throbs with this vitality of somebody who is playing around with a new medium and excited for all of the potential of it lots of history there yeah. and uh, I think it it goes without saying but Canopy's the best video streamer when it comes to quality, thoughtful entertainment. Alone. Oh, yeah, no question. I, you combine all those elements, and you've got a really special service. That's why we're allowed the given the ability to talk about uh, such great documentaries and to talk to such great people. Um, to get all this with no ads, with just a library card, is unbelievable. Um, we hope you continue to watch Canopy. You continue to enjoy all of the offerings at home. You follow them on the socials, at Canopy. Uh, that's really, really important. You can find about anything new that they've got coming your way. Um, this was a really fun episode. Yeah, no, I, th this is, this to me just encapsulates so much of what it is that I love about this service. And as we've seen so many other streamers just kind of go more nakedly commercial, uh, <laughs> the fact that Canopy, like Alex was saying, really cares about curation, really cares about film history, um, you know, that's what makes it special and unique. And all you need is your card from your public or academic library, and you have access to the entire history of cinema and so much recent work as well. It's all there for you. So thanks for, uh, for listening and uh, go watch something.